When the artist is station of an animal, he distorts to show the whole body on the decorative field. This originates mainly in the necessity felt by the artist of introducing all the symbols in the decoration. of the museum for popular entertainment must not be underrated, particularly in a large city where every attraction that counteracts the influence of the saloon and of the racetrack is of great social importance. We need to show how far each civilization is the outcome of its geographical and historical surroundings. We want a collection arranged according to tribes in order to teach the particular style of each group. Yet it happens that any array of objects is only an exceedingly fragmentary presentation of the true life of a people. All the objects are primarily incidental expressions of complex mental processes that are themselves the subject of anthropological inquiry. Ultimately, the psychological and historical relations of culture cannot be expressed by so small a portion of ethnic life as is presented by objects in museums. Boaz moves steadily away from the public and from public influence on science. He turned from the museum to the university as the institutional home for the future profession of anthropology. And he insisted that that profession be cut off from the untrained amateur element that had formed such an important part of American anthropology as recently as the 1880s. In turning to the university department and in cutting off the amateurs from the profession, Boaz profoundly changed the course of American anthropology. Since I took hold of the work in New York, I have tried to develop a well-organized school of anthropology. I make it a rule to tell every student who proposes to take up anthropology that the chances of finding a position as an anthropologist are very slim. When they insist, there's nothing for me to do but give them the best instruction I can. Franz Boas had a lifelong interest in the relationship between race and culture. When he worked with the Quackyutl, he spent a lot of time looking at the way they moved, their motor habits, their patterns of dance, and other forms of expressive culture, so that the film became an avenue into their behavior, a means of looking at the culturally learned ways of moving that these people had, which made them different from other people. He was convinced that racial explanations of behavior were inadequate and that with this footage, he would be able to demonstrate the cultural basis of their dance and their movements. Boaz believed that the camera gave him a superior way of understanding behavior. In a way, Boaz's belief in the superiority of the camera was a naive belief that somehow film was more realistic and more authentic than other forms of communication. But the belief that the film would allow him to study is certainly one that contemporary researchers would agree with. So that he begins something, a tradition, 
which is with us today and an important one, an important means of studying human behavior. The dance problem is difficult, but I hope that the films will give me adequate material for making a real study of the style motor question. The relation between general motor habits and the dance is a complicated matter. Having Edward Curtis's 1914 epic film on the Quackadoodle to compare with Franz Boas's research footage shot in 1930 of the Quackadoodle allows us a chance to look at two very different, if not opposing, uses of the cinema. To Boas, the cinema and film was a means to study behavior, that is to record the present conditions, but to look through them at, and to restore the behavior that was once there in the ethnographic present. For Edward Curtis, on the other hand, cinema was a means to restore and reconstruct behavior for audiences in theaters so that they might see how the Quackadoodle lived at one time. Curtis needed the image in front of the camera to be as authentic as possible, which required Curtis to spend a great deal of money having all of the materials for the sets built. He had the canoes built, he had the totem poles built, he had the false front houses built, and these were done by authentic Quackadoodle carvers down to asking every actor in the film to shave their mustaches off because authentic Quackadoodle never had beards or mustaches, according to Curtis, and to wear wigs because their hair was too short. That is, his concern for authentic detail was quite remarkable for the time. If we compare portions of the two films, it's very easy to see how these differences manifest themselves. For instance, if we look at the cannibal dance, we have, with Boaz, footage for research, therefore footage without context. For Curtis, all of the emphasis is on making the image believable, so that we see something of what it might have been at one time. However, we are looking at Curtis's fantasy of what it might have been, rather than something that actually was occurring at the time. That is, he restored the behavior and reconstructed rather than found it. And you have to realize that anthropologists have a very, um, what's called a my people complex. That is, if you spend a long time working with a particular culture, you have a heavy emotional investment in seeing that your view of them is the dominant one. And of course, anyone who comes along and presents a different view is bound to threaten you. And particularly, I think the relationship between Curtis and Boaz must have been a difficult one because Curtis represented that which Boaz was unalterably opposed to, which was the amateur, non-academic anthropologist. There had to be that kind of hostility or antagonism between the two people because they represent two very different ways of dealing with anthropology. Boaz went to Theodore Roosevelt and suggested that Roosevelt convene a committee of respected senior scientific people to look into the credentials of Edward Curtis with the idea, no doubt, that Boaz had of stopping Curtis from continuing his work. From what we can gather, the committee exonerated Curtis for he continued the rest of his life to complete the study of the North American Indians and Boaz continued to make anthropology a part of the world that he was interested in, that is, the world of museums and universities. I have the conviction that in certain lines of work, I know exactly what is needed for furthering our knowledge of American ethnology. And I believe that the method which I'm pursuing is more systematic than that followed by others. For this reason, I've ventured to concentrate in my hands a considerable part of the ethnological work on our continent. My dear George, what I would like to have is detailed information about what we might call the religion of the Quackoodle in olden times. You remember we talked a number of times about their old prayers to the sun and the way in which they thought the sun was a kind of god. Whatever you can get on this would be of great interest. You will use the winter months and try to write as much as possible. 
We are both getting older, and we ought to try to get everything we can relating to the customs of the people. Dear Dr. Boaz, in this mail I send you nine pages on how the Indians know the sun is the chief of the upper world. I will write some more sun songs and prayers used by the Quagyol tribes in the year 1860. Although the Catholic priest tried to show them to pray to God, this they would not believe, for their God is the sun. In the beginning, it was always hard work to ask about the language. Such a confusion of dialects and languages exists here that the material overwhelms me. The Quakutl language is much harder than I thought. I work on the grammar in the mornings, in the afternoons, old fellows tell me stories, and in the evenings, when George Hunt is free, I revise texts with him. The work with George Hunt is an outstanding example of what Boaz accomplished. He wanted to preserve the ways of life of the Indian people in their own words while it was still possible. He trained the people he could. He struggled himself for years to master the unusual sounds, unfamiliar sounds of the languages. And he worked with Indian people as colleagues. He trained someone like George Hunt to write his own language. And George Hunt, as a result, produced many thick volumes of Quakutal culture, which are now a major source of what we can know about the traditional way of life of the Quakutal. Boas was probably the first one among all linguists to understand that the paramount importance of uh, linguistic studies was that language is created at the level of the unconscious mind. And uh, that through language, we can uh, reach really the most basic properties of the operation of the human mind. Boaz uh, established a standard he believed that the study of Indian cultures was as important as the study of any cultures in the world, and that language was a crucial part of that. It was a, a central to meaning. And that just if you had to know Chinese or French to study those cultures, you had to know the Indian language to study these. In doing so, he discovered that these languages were as beautiful and as rich in their way as any languages, and that many of the ideas people had about language in general weren't true. They didn't fit these languages. Harm Smith was born about 1900, so he's just about as old as the century. Uh, I first met him in the summer of 1951, and I've been working with him uh, off and on ever since. He was the one I worked most uh, closely with in, in learning Wasco, and working on the grammar and uh, the dictionary of the language, and recording texts, too. He uh, is an amazing man in many ways. He's very fluent in English, very oriented toward the, the world outside the reservation, and yet he has an amazing knowledge of all the localities and all the birds and animals and plants and fish and <laughs> things that are part of the traditional culture, too. Let me read this to you. Mm -hmm. Translate it for me, if you would. Kwap sluniksh garskim. Dika and shokhwa anchhelaida. Garskoch sluniksh ilkach diksh. Yeah, well... It came up the Cascade Range and three of the mountains or girls, you'd say, said, we, we're going to stay here. We're going to sit here. And they became the three sisters. The mother said, I'm going to sit here. And she became Mount Hood. What about that? Few students have considered it necessary to familiarize themselves sufficiently with native languages to understand directly what the people whom they study speak about. Fewer still have deemed it worthwhile to record the customs and beliefs and traditions of the people in their own words, thus giving us objective material which will stand the scrutiny of painstaking investigation. <laughs> Uh -huh, uh -huh. Mount Hood. The great thing about harm, the thing that's true also of other traditional Indians is they'll only tell you the things they're sure they know. I enjoy teaching the Wasco language. I've taught, I've worked with Yel Del for about 25 years now on this language deal. Are there other people who speak Wasco? Oh, there's a few. Few of my people speak it on the reservation. 
Not too many anymore. There's some on the Columbia, along the Columbia River that speaks it. My tribe's all gone. Gone. There ain't many left now. most intensive work is immediately required because the knowledge is rapidly vanishing. He was the very first, as a linguist, to understand that it was impossible to describe exotic languages using the traditional framework used by linguists for Indo-European languages. And it was that it was necessary to invent, to create a new framework for each particular language which was being studied. And this carried a very important lesson for all of us, not only for linguists, because the same is true in the field of uh, social organization, in the field of religion, in the field of art. We have to really invent a new frame of reference and try to avoid imposing an outside frame of reference on new material. About 19... 10 or a little before, there was a good deal of consideration in this country as to whether we should allow all the people of Europe from the different parts of Europe to come in here. And so a commission was appointed by the Senate uh, to investigate this matter, different populations of Europe which were uh, acceptable and which were less acceptable. At the time, there were 42 reports written by different people, presumably some of them scientists and other people. And so Boas used instruments, calipers, and all kinds to measure the various parts of the body and then to develop very large statistical tables. It was really the important base of an advanced study of physical anthropology that was developed during that time. The investigation of a large number of families has shown that every single measurement that we made and studied has one value among individuals born in Europe and another among individuals of the same families born in America. It is remarkable that the change in head form of American-born individuals occurs almost immediately after the arrival of their parents in this country. These observations indicate that the mental makeup of man may be considerably influenced by a social and geographical environment rather than race. We do not yet know what produces changes in human types. The old idea of absolute stability must be given up, and with it, the belief in the hereditary superiority of certain types over others. Among us, race antagonism is a fact, and we should try to understand its psychological significance. Boaz was one of the first prominent Jews in the United States to recognize that there was an advantage for Jews to defend and assist the black people in this country. He tried to shift the main focus of anthropological research from the North American Indian to the black people here in the United States and elsewhere in the world. By shifting to blacks, Boaz was making a significant break in anthropology. He wanted to study a people who lived here within white society, whereas anthropologists had historically studied peoples who lived outside the boundaries of white society. Now, why did Boaz want to look at race in a new way? Why did Boaz want to make these shifts to blacks? One, Boaz, B. 
believed that science could help in important ways to solve important social and political problems. That's debatable, but he believed that. Second, Boaz was a Jew born and raised in Germany who had suffered anti-Semitic discrimination and persecution in Germany and later here in the United States. The new way of looking at race was a way of attacking and discrediting racial and religious prejudice, including anti-Semitism. How successful was Boaz in achieving his unique goals? Not very. It was not until the triumph of Hitler and his racist philosophy that the Boazian point of view became more widely accepted because then the Boazian point of view coincided with the new domestic and foreign policies of the United States. I can still remember quite vividly what happened on that day, December 21st, 1942. Boas invited a few persons to a luncheon with Rivet at uh, the faculty club at Columbia University. It was an extremely cold day, as a matter of fact, one of the coldest day I can remember. And Boas arrived early from uh, his home, his grandhood on the other side of the Hudson. Uh, he was wearing, I remember, a very dilapidated and discolored fur cap which probably dated back to his time with the Eskimo 50 years uh, earlier. Boas was in, a very, in very high spirits and uh, luncheon started quite uh, gaily. Uh, and then uh, all of a sudden, Boas uh, was struck by something like an electric uh, shock. He pushed violently and fell backward on the ground with his chair. And I was uh, seated by his side and immediately I tried to help him, but uh, he was uh, dead. And we all left uh, struck with uh, sorrow and with the feeling that we had the sad privilege to witness the passing out of uh, one of the very last intellectual giants, such as the 19th century was able to produce, and uh, uh, whom probably uh, will not be produced anymore. In my opinion, Laws of cultural development as rigid as the laws of physics are supposed to be are unattainable. Absolute laws for phenomena as complex as those of culture are impossible. They will always be reflections of our own culture.
This program was produced by Public Broadcasting Associates Boston, which is solely responsible for its contents. For a transcript, send $3 to Odyssey, Box 1000, Boston, Massachusetts, 02118. Major funding for Odyssey was provided by National Endowment for the Humanities. Additional funding was provided by 